So we're holding the Kavot towards the end of Perek Levi, chapter 4. Mishnah Kaf Aleph, very important Mishnah, that gives us quite a few explanations as to why many people are miserable. Many, many unhappy people around, not only these days, throughout history. But what is their source of misery? They're, they're lacking? No. Rabbi Le'ezer Akapar, he says that envy, jealousy, tava, desire, kavod, the pursuit of honor, drive a person away from this world. What kind of an expression is to drive a person away from this world? It basically, he's saying, in, in other words, that it ruins his life. It removes him from his ultimate mission where one should be focused in certain things that are noble, the mitzvot, for example, and good deeds. Instead of that, he's focusing and expending a lot of energy on the, the pursuit of things that are totally vain, totally not necessary, without a proper understanding that these things don't necessarily make you happy. In other words, such an individual is confused, misguided, and miserable. We've, said about, we've, we've mentioned this before, is an expression that is used for this world and the world to come. In other words, the one who has these faults, these weaknesses, to the extreme, of course, he may not, not only not enjoy this world, he may actually lose the potential that he could have gained in the world to come. And the reason I say potential, I don't want to say that he loses his world to come. For the most part, most Jews do have a share to the world to come. Everyone does have some mitzvot and I'm sure some good deeds. But his true potential, what he could have acquired, what he could have achieved, perhaps is, is gone. Unless he comes back in another reincarnation, but that's another lifetime. And all because of what? Because kinata kavod. These particular midot are very, very serious very serious characteristics because, as the commentaries explain, the immediate consequence of, of putting an emphasis on this, in other words, when, where these things are really on our mind all the time, the immediate consequence is that it weakens a Jew's commitment, a Jew's connection to the Torah. It weakens his emunah, his faith in Hashem. Plus, it does not give him any motivation whatsoever, any interest in working on himself. To work on oneself, to become a better person, to refine one's character, is really something that Judaism always uh, emphasizes, that we should aspire to be like our forefathers, that we should continuously try to improve, our, whether it's our midot, our character, our devotion, our shalom bayit, our peace at home. There are many areas of life that can use improvement. You know, some things are not changeable, you know, but some things can, and they, are those, and they are dependent pretty much on our free will. In those areas where we do have free will, it can make a big difference. The quality of life can make a, a world of a difference. Attitude is one. You know, your salary may not change no matter what you do, even if you have a PhD. We've discussed this many times, because money, position, job, and even who you marry, the kind of children you have, is all really part of the package called mazal. But we don't have too much control. It's part of our destiny, our mission. But there are areas of our life where we can make a difference. Wow, we can make a difference. Not only can we make a difference to the world, we can make a difference in our own personal life, depending on our attitude. And the attitude depends on how we see life, how we see life and how we see ourselves in this life. What does it all mean to us? And the less understanding a person has, obviously the less knowledgeable he is, he is much more reactive than proactive. He reacts to situations. He doesn't really uh, think about things well, thoroughly, and cannot really plan on how he wants to conduct himself. He's reacting based on instinct, based on personality, and so forth. And this is a, a, as a result of lack of knowledge, the knowledge of Torah. Whereas one who has learned, one who is somewhat familiar with what life is all about, hopefully, Obviously, even if we're familiar, it doesn't, it's not a guarantee, but hopefully, because we're familiar with uh, what is expected of us, we will avoid the pitfalls. 
We don't want to make the mistakes that others have made. We have the advantage of starting our life. And even if you're already 40, 50, you still can begin every day to avoid the mistake of others that others have made. We always have, as long as we're alive, like we say in the morning, as long as we're alive, as long as the, the candle is lit, we can still do repair work, we can still change certain things, we can still make a difference if we haven't done till now. What will stand in the way? Three things stand very much in the way. There are, are others, there are others, we don't, and we spoke quite a bit about other, uh, I guess you can call them uh, weaknesses or faults or wrong ways of looking at life. But here, these are very, very extreme, very serious. Kinat Havavakavot will stand in the way of achievement, will stand of spiritual achievement, especially. Uh, one will have no interest, no motivation on working on himself, on becoming a better person. He's so engrossed in Kinat Havavakavot, in, in per, the pursuit of all these things, that he has no interest. And uh, speaking to him, motivating him, is pretty much a, a lost case. So that's why he says, they really drive him out of this world. They really remove him from reality. But the consequences are worse. It's not just he's removed from reality and he has a good life. No, he has a miserable life. But the point here is not just about the quality of life. Rabbi Le'ezer is not only telling us that these people will never be happy because of, this, of these weaknesses. He's telling us that this has terrible consequences, physically and spiritually. Physically, what are the physical consequences of somebody who has kinata avadikavot? He can become sick. And you know, and today in our world, the world of medicine, we have the kilim, we have the tools to measure certain illnesses in cholesterol, in calories, in blood pressure, in sugar, in uh, in uh, the arteries being clogged or being narrow and not allowing the blood to flow, which can cause heart attacks and strokes. We have the tools that we are, where we can see what this life of either uh, excess in food, for example, has done to him. Tava, as an example. What has this Tava done to this person? He eats so much, he has become overweight, obese, as they say. Well. Some people are obese and they're okay, but they're not really okay because we know that there's a direct consequence that he has to pay, and that is the, the extra weight is increasing his heartbeat, uh, his blood pressure. There could be problems in other areas of the body, other organs as a result, right? And it's never ending. We don't know how the body is going to react because it depends, of course, on the genes, it depends on other things too. Nonetheless, it's not healthy, and we know that. Today it has been proven, and we have the tools to measure. So this is with ta'ava. But the same is true with kin'ah. In kavod, the pursuit of honor, people who are so happy, uh, so unhappy, so distressed, so disappointed. It does it has a similar effect. It causes stress. Today people are under tremendous stress, not just because of the amount of work, but because of all kinds of things that are going on today that did not happen in the past that life is very demanding, but it's more demanding of those who have expectations. Those who live a simple life are much happier. Uh, they're not necessarily under the same kind of stress. Yes, traffic causes stress. Yes, it's not, it's not our fault. You know, what can you do? Well, put in a good music tape. Put some Torah tape. You might as well. You're an hour in the road. Why waste the time? Baruch Hashem for the Japanese to have made those cassette recorders or the DVDs that we can put them in our car. You know, well, yeah, think about it. Why waste out? Now, be careful. If you're listening, you want to still be focused on the road. You know, it's it, can, it can be a little bit dangerous. A little bit. Depends <laughs> what you're doing. No text messaging, of course. But to listen to Shu may be a good thing. It's not only it's not only opportunity to acquire knowledge and to learn Torah, which is a mitzvah as well. It can lower the amount of frustration. Oh, this is terrible road again. You have no choice. Your job is there, and you live here. That's the only way to get to work, until you can afford a helicopter. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, I, and I'm not uh, exaggerating. In South America, the rich do have helicopters to go to work and to avoid these problems. 
So we see that because of the stresses, the various stresses of life, especially in the 20, 21st century, there are all kinds of illnesses that may not have existed in the past. In the past, they did have things that we have cured. You don't hear of smallpox as much today, right? You don't hear that much of tuberculosis, Baruch Hashem. But those were very, very uh, dangerous and quite common not too long ago. So they were able to overcome it. But these midot, these midot, unfortunately, have caused tremendous harm to many, many people throughout history. And you can see this examples, not only in history books, you can see examples in the Torah. In history books, I'm talking about the non-Jewish world in particular, where you can see what people have done, what they were capable of doing just to get the power, just to get their hands on, on, on something that they very much wanted, whether it was a woman, whether it was money, what people were, were prepared to do. But that's history. But we see it in examples even in our Torah. We see it even with the best of, the, of, of, of characters, that sometimes they fail, sometimes they make mistakes as a result of the poor judgment. So we have the, the famous examples in the Torah we have, beginning with Cain and Hevel, the two brothers. What caused the murder of Hevel? Kina. So we have the first example of, of jealousy. Then we have Ta'avad, the Dor HaMabul, the generation of the flood. Look where it led them. Shem had to destroy them, the, the entire world because these people, all they cared about was Ta'avad, their desires. That's all they were interested in. No service of God, no spirituality, just the flesh, just eat and, and other things that have to do with the desires. They were destroyed. Then we have Dora, Dora Palaga, that they built the Tower of Babel. As the rabbis tell us, that they were very much in pursuit of their kavod, of honor, arrogance. And of course, that was their downfall as well. Many, many examples in the Tanakh with Gehazi, the, the helper of Elisha who got into a lot of trouble because of his coveting, of his wanting to the, the compensation. He wanted to get his eyes on money. Yeah, as they say, I think in several languages, he had big eyes, you know. And that, that of course, led to trouble. Yerov Am ben Nevat, also tremendous Tamil tremendous person, tremendous leader, but because of his kavod, the pursuit of the kavod, very much it bothered him that it, that he wanted to have that honor, that he wanted to have the highest position, he wanted to be king. He was jealous of the Ham, the son of Shalom, and the kingdom, as you know, split. And he, as a result of his anger, kavod, arrogance, whatever you want to call it, it drove him out of this world, and, and some say out of Olam Abba as well. In other words, he was uh, very much consumed or obsessed with kavod. And these are examples that are all documented for us to learn from that the best of the best. Well, why is it documented? Because we should realize that this is a, an ongoing problem. It's not just history, it's ongoing. Human beings are pretty much the same. Just today, they drive cars. In the olden days, they, they, they rode on top of a donkey. You know. you know, obviously technology has advanced and life appears to be different, but human beings are human beings. And the same weaknesses and faults of the past exist today. The same problems exist today, and, and worse even sometimes. And somebody like Yerov Am had many good qualities, I'm sure, too. But look at what he did to him. Look, look. And that is why we are reading and learning about it, because it could destroy. It could destroy even a good person. So you have to be careful with it. Kin'a and Ta'ava are, are so... So let's, let's, I'm looking for a better word other than just extreme and dangerous. They're so useless. They're so totally not logical that you can see people who have it to the extreme are willing to do the most silliest thing because of the Kinataba. And I'm going to give you a, I don't know if it really happened, they say it's a mashal. <laughs> It would be hard to believe if it really happened, but it's a mashal that gives us an idea of how far it can go, how illogical it is, and how sad it is for a person to have it. There was a Kanai and a Hamdan who were walking together on the road. Kanai means one who's very, very jealous. He wants everything for himself. He's, he's, you know, was, he wants every, everything that some, somebody else has to himself. And there was a Hamdan, one who just wants a lot. 
you know, everything that he sees, he wants for himself. So th th I guess they're friends because they, the two pretty much uh, can get along. <laughs> and the king meets up with them. A king uh, sees the two of them and says, you know, you, you two guys, I, I want to make you an offer. I want one of you to ask whatever he wants, and I'll give him, grant him his wishes. But whatever the one asked, the other one I'm going to give double. So the jealous guy says, you go first. The jealous guy tells the Hamdan, who would decide, you know, because he's jealous, why should he get two? You follow? He doesn't want to ask first, he wants the Hamdan to ask so because he's jealous. He, he does, he want, doesn't. The Hamdan says, no, you know, I want everything for myself, I want to. Anyway, so what happened? The Hamdan finally said, decided, okay, I'll go first. Take out an eye for me. <laughs> so the other guy got, to, you know, two eyes taken out. <laughs> it's funny, but uh, there's some truth to all of this, and that is that people who have these qualities, these midot, are willing to go to all kinds of extremes to do all kinds of terrible things just because of the midah of kina or chemda or tava. They drive a person crazy. They drive him out of this world. There was once a Hazan who was very, apparently he was a, he was a, he had a very good voice. And he approached Rabbi Sal Salante, Rabbi, I have a problem, I want you to help me. What should I do to, to control all the kavod and gava that I may have, may get, when I sing before and pray before the congregation, especially on the high holidays, you know, it's a, it's a big kavod and, you know, how can I, can you give me some idea how to control that kavod, that, uh, or the gava, the arrogance that will come as a result of having Baruch Hashem, this very, very admired, very big position. So the rabbi tells him, when you're in the middle of praying, just take off your talit from your head and turn around and you'll see how people are laughing at you. That is how you will know that is how you will realize that there's nothing to be proud of. The, what the rabbi was telling him is that you think you're such a big shot, you think that people really like it, you think that people really look up to you. It's all fake, you know, even though it may be nice, but just remember it, there's a whole bunch of people too who are making fun of you. Now, this was also an indirect hint to this man that his chazanut was not l'shem shamayim. Right? It was not for the sake of heaven, because if he would, then he wouldn't even ask this question. The fact that he was thinking about this, kavod, in other words, that it means whether he's disturbed or not is another question. It means it's on his mind. One way to, to somehow eliminate it is just remember there's a lot of people laughing at you. There's nothing for you to be so, so proud of. And uh, even though this is not a, a, a fix for person who has a weakness of pursuit of kavod, it does put him down a little bit. It does, it is a little humbling when you think about it. Oh, not everybody really likes me. Not everybody's looking up to it. Oh, people are laughing. You know, it, 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 it's somehow it's like pouring cold water on somebody who's, you know, asleep. It, it wakes him up. It, it gets him to realize that he's, maybe he's not so great. Of all these three, the commentaries tell us that if somebody is not nagua u mushchat, if he's not corrupted in midata kavod, in other words, he's not, he's not, he doesn't have a problem with the pursuit of honor. He doesn't. He's just a kanai and, and a hamdan. He has taavot. He has kina. He has jealousy. He has desires. Very very strong. Very very much developed. But he's not so. You know, weak in the kavod. Baruch Hashem, I, I'm, it, it would be very sad to see somebody who had all three. But, but the commentaries explain it, that the, this last one, kavod, is very critical. If one does not have that weakness, then there's a, a better chance for him to do some repair work on kina and tava. He has kina, he has tava. 
he could learn, we can show him the way, and he hopefully will be amenable to, to changing his ways. You know what the problem of the kavod is? A person who's really, really obsessed with pursuit of honor, he needs people to give him kavod, uh, his dignity matters to him so much, is that if you tell him, you gotta do teshuvah, he's not gonna listen to you. To the teshuvah? The kavod will not allow him to listen to reprimands, to criticism. You tell him, why don't you go make peace with your brother? Why don't you go make peace with, with, this, uh, with your neighbor? Why don't you go ask forgiveness from this one? It's beneath my kavod, some people might say. Who will say beneath my kavod? One who has a problem with kavod. One who does not have a problem with kavod. Well, what's the big deal? Say, I'm sorry. You know, let's make up. Let's start all over again. Forgive me. You know, you're right. That's a good point. I accept your criticism. Your rebuke is, 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 uh, is right, is correct. A person who has a problem with the pursuit of kavod, he has a therefore a more difficult time doing teshuvah, more difficult time uh, correcting his wrongs. There's a very nice pasuk in Mishlei that, that at first glance it's hard to understand what he's saying, but you will realize that it has to do with this. He says, Chaye besarim lev marpeh. Well, kina is, is a word we can identify in the pasuk. So is basar and lev, but it, the whole pasuk doesn't really make sense. What is it? What's his message? In Sefer Mishle, as well as Kohelet, by the way, is powerful, very important. I very much hold that every Jew, at least once in his life, should have learned the entire Sefer Mishle and Kohelet. And the earlier, the better, because it gives him. It gives one really perspective, very good perspective of life, what life is all about, all the dangers in life, all the pitfalls, uh, what priorities should be, what is not a priority. So he says, Chaye besarim lev marpe. Lev marpe is a heart that is flexible, a heart that is soft, rafui. You could also say marpe from, the, from a healthy heart. But here it means more a heart that is not harsh, a heart that does not have too many desires and uh, does not covet a lot, it's easy going. He has chayei besarim, he has a life of meat, flesh. What does that mean? It means that the basar, just like basar is, can be soft, so is his life is easy, his life is soft, he can carry it, it's not burdensome. As opposed to what? As opposed to the second half of the Paksuk that says, Urekav atzamot kina. The person who's jealous and therefore unhappy, and not easygoing, and not content, he, that's like Rekav atzamot. It's like it, it, it rots the bones. The, for the bones to rot, by the way, the, the, the Kabbalists tell us that the person who had kina throughout his life, his bones will rot in the grave. And that's also insinuated in this pasuk. But he, he was not so much talking about the grave. He's talking about during one's lifetime, it is like rekabat samot. He's so unhappy. He's so jealous. He so much wants everything for himself. He so much wants what the other one has that it eats himself up, like they say. Wochel it's, it's, it, it, it destroys him. It, it's like a rot to the bone. Whereas a person who has a lev marpe, he's content, he's easygoing, He's not desirous so much of everything. He gets along with people. He's happier. He has chaye besarim. He has a, a, a more natural, let's call maybe, let's call chaye besarim more, a natural, easy uh, life where, without too many hardships. A lot depends on our heart, in other words, on which is really the attitude, the, the outlook, and how we conduct ourselves in various situations that may be problematic, may be difficult, but we, we take it easy. That is much healthier than a person who ha who's day and night uh, preoccupied with his kina. Before we go on to the next Mishnah, the rabbis warn us that these words are not only intended for those who have a problem in these areas. These words, this message is very, very much as well intended to those who bring it about those who cause others to be jealous of them by being ostentatious. Driving a great, the latest car, Lamborghini. 
I don't know if that's such a great car, but they say it's expensive, <laughs> right? Or even though he has the money to, I think it's in English, it's to flaunt, in other words, to show off, to, to overemphasize something in front of people. Here, look at this. You know. Why? What for? To take, you're taking people's eyes out, as they say in Hebrew. It, it's not nice. Now, even though a wealthy man is entitled to have a big wedding, it's his kavod. He has the money. Hashem blessed him. He's entitled to invite 2,000 people too. He's entitled to it. Even so, there's a way to do it that it would be with modesty and not overly exaggerated. There's a way even to do something big and nice modestly. So people who have wealth are being warned. Don't bring about, don't cause others to be jealous of you by showing off your wealth. Women are being warned to be very tsnoa, tsanoa, be very modest so that men should not look at you. And unfortunately, many, many women don't understand that. On the contrary, they, they very much are professionals in getting the man to look at them. What, what don't they do? And that is the problem we had with, of course, in the Torah with Eshet Potiphar and Yosef. You know, that's what she did, basically to get his attention. And the Kinah, we see with the brothers of Yosef too. That Yosef, in a sense, brought it upon himself by telling them the dreams. Why tell them the dreams? And Yaakov, in a sense, too. Why show favoritism? The rabbis tell us, don't do that. In other words, don't be a cause for these things to happen. To cause others to be jealous of you. To cause others to want what you have. To cause others to sin. Chaz v'shalom, because of a lack of modesty and so forth. Don't think that these midot are only bad midot. There's actually some good. If Hashem created these inclinations, there must be something good in them too. Rabbi tells us with Kinah, for example, Kinah Sofrim Tarbe Chochmah. The envy that rabbis have from each, for, from each other is good because it leads them, it encourages them to strive to become better, to be more knowledgeable, to learn more. Kinah Sofrim, they call it, the envy of Sofrim, of scribes, of scholars. Tarbe Chochmah. It raises, it increases the amount of Chochmah of knowledge because people, oh, he was able to achieve this. He was able to write a book. I want to write a book too. I want to be able to open up a yeshiva too. The more the better. That's positive. That's kinat sofrim. But it's kinat, no, but it's a positive kinat because it elevates the Torah. It elevates chokhmah. That is a desirous consequence. That is a desirous result. So that kind of kinat leads to something positive. And the same with ta'ava. What could, what could be a good tava? There is a pasuk. Let me see if I wrote it down here. A pasuk in Tehilim. Negdecha kol ta'avati, David HaMelech says. All my desires towards you. All my desires to do the service of Hashem. Could you imagine? Think about it. Take a thousand Jews. A thousand people. I want to ask you honestly. Think about it for a moment. How many wake up, and either the first moment they wake up, or the moment they leave their home, the moment they go to work, how many are saying to themselves or to Hashem, Hashem, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be your servant. That's all I have on my mind. That's all I care about. Please, I want you to do your best to guesstimate how many in a thousand would actually think like that. Fifty-five. No, no percentages. Give me numbers. Fifty. Fifty? In thousand? In one thousand. You have a thousand Jews, randomly, right? Not the Nebrak or Me'ashadim Jews, right? <laughs> okay? Randomly, take a thousand, because that's what, that's what we do. When we do statistics, we do it random, right? Take a thousand Jews, a couple from America, a couple from France, Great Britain, Israel. Talk about people who know God, of course. He, that he exists. Well, we can't count those who don't believe. What do you say? Five, six. Five, six. How about you? Of 1,000, yeah. I'd say all of them subconsciously. What? All of them? All of them subconsciously? No, no, I don't mean subconsciously. Oh. I mean, honestly, they actually mm -hmm. say those words. <laughs> One, okay. 
A hundred out of a thousand say that? I'd love to meet them. Yeah. Huh? Did you get what I was saying? I mean, more or less, to express those words on a daily basis, pretty much, almost on a daily basis, pretty much, as he wakes up, as he's leaving the door, not to say it from the prayer book, which may contain words as such, to say it on his own with his own words. So it doesn't have to be modani, it could just be thank you for... No, not modani, because that's part of the prayers. I'm talking about that he, on his own, understands, wishes to say that, really feels that way, and expresses those words at some point during the day, and every other day, you know, leaving the door, waking up, maybe in the 12 o'clock noon, feels that way. David Amelech said it, right? That's pretty much what he's saying. I don't think not even one in a thousand. A half, if that existed. No. No, I don't think so. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say, no, not thank you. Okay, that's what you have to understand. I gave a very unique example. Take somebody from the moment he wakes up, again, to the moment he goes to sleep, on an average, okay? Will you hear from him, or when will you hear from him words as such that David Amela says, Hashem, you know, all that I care about, my greatest concern, and the most important thing that I want to accomplish life is to do your will, right? Thank you, not for, for the family and for the money, I'm not talking about that. No, no, no. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and give me this life to be your servant. These are, um, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. You know, it was where a person is actually feels that Hashem has actually given him an opportunity, a mission to accomplish, and he feels very happy with it, and he wants to do his best. And that's the most important thing that he cares about, not his job, not his family, not his house, not his garden, not his car. That's the main thing, and that's what he mainly asks for in his prayers too. Give me success to be a devoted servant to you. I don't think it's, it's maybe one in a million. So if we have 13 million Jews, well, maybe, maybe, maybe one in 100,000. Let me not say a million. One in 100,000, not one in a million. One in 100,000. So if we have 13 million Jews, you can make basically do the math. There's not that many. No, it's not sad. It, it's, it's quite, it's a very high level. Oh, uh, it would be beautiful, I mean, it's sad. Of course, you could say it's sad, because of course it would be nicer than the world. But the majority of people, and the next Mishnah will explain to us why, more or less, this doesn't happen. The majority of people are not focused on that. You ask the average person, so what goes on during your day? Well, hopefully he prays. Hopefully he eats, he doesn't fast. Maybe he even does a little bit of uh, exercise. If he's married, he attends to his wife, he does some of the shopping, he takes care of his kids, he does homework, he writes checks for the bills, he's on the internet checking the news, hopefully not other things, just you know, important things, right? And then maybe he, he takes a nap, I mean, he does sleep, he goes, to, he goes to the restroom, he makes phone calls. This is the, more or less what most people go through in life. I mean, you gotta visit somebody sick, sometimes you gotta go to a funeral, yes. There's extras. You, I just came from a wedding, for example. I, 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 was, I was hesitating. Should I go? I have a shiur. I have to prepare. But I said, I'll just go for the chuppah and come right back. At least I was able to do that and accomplish that. So these things in your life, you put them in. Okay. So in all that, when does a person for a moment take a moment to think, you know, Hashem, you know, you're number one. Everything else is number two, three, four, five. And therefore, help me do this. Help me accomplish it. I want to do the best job possible. Forgive me for what I've done in the past. You know, you have a whole conversation with them. Now I'm going to tell you the truth. Even though I said that it's very, very low, a low number, in reality, the Hasidut that came into the world with the Baal Shem Tov, it brought this idea to the forefront. Whether it was the Baal Shem Tov, or whether it was the later of Nachman in Breslav, or whether it was all the other tzaddikim that lived. This is what Hasidut 
amongst other things, stressed, have a conversation with God. Talk to him like he's your friend, your buddy. He understands Chinese too, by the way. God, any language you want. And do it every so often, especially if you're by yourself. Now, that's just part of it. It's, that does not tell us what the conversation is all about. That's just the prepare uh, the, the, the human mind to have that conversation. Take a moment to think about that and talk to him. Once you train yourself to do that, your prayers will have more kavanah, hopefully. You will think more about the words you say. You will mean what you say. And as you begin to work on yourself, you begin to learn more and become more knowledgeable about the Torah and the beauty of creation, and everything begins to make sense, the design, the harmony. Maybe we should close the door. Yeah. Then, then he becomes more in tune to Hashem. It's like his antennas are up. An antenna is up. In other words, you're picking up the signals. Hashem is able to relate to you directly. You pick up on messages just like that. If you did something wrong, you know it right away. If you don't know it, He lets you know somehow. That's part of a very close relationship with Hashem. When a person is consumed with kinata, lavikavot, can you imagine? He's at the exact opposite end of somebody like that. He has no emunah and bitachon in God. Otherwise, he wouldn't have the problem of kina. Because what does emunah and bitachon say? Hashem gave me what I need. Right? I should want for more? I'm, this is what he wants me to have. He cares so much about me that if he knows that if I need something, he would give it to me. And if he doesn't give it to me, it's because he knows that either I don't need it or because for some other good reason, I don't need to have it right now or I don't need to have it at all or whatever. Hashem knows best. He loves us. But somebody who's consumed with kina and tava, how, he doesn't think like that. He's so far away from that kind of a relationship, completely far away. Kavod? <laughs> kavod is the funniest one, and it's the saddest one, too, because what do you care about kavod for? You know? <laughs> kavod is an olam abba. Hashem will give you the kavod that you deserve. Kavod? What do you need kavod? But we began to say that all these three have something good, right? So kina, oh, Sofrim is good. Ta'ava for the love and service of Hashem is good. And where's a good kavod? Self-esteem. A little bit of self-esteem you need to have. You need to be proud of being Jewish. To be proud of yourself a little bit. Otherwise, again, it's no good. Because then you're not going to be motivated. Why should I do it? What am I? Nothing. You are special. Hashem brought you to this world no matter, no matter how tall you are. Even, even if you're a midget, you'll be on the world book records. <laughs> Even a midget has a mission, right? People complain about all kinds of things because they're totally not focused on what, what they're doing here. The fact that Hashem brought us into this world means something. It means we're special, especially the Jewish people. We are His children. So these midot, kinata, vave kavot, can be applied in a positive way too. But the one that I, I felt needed a little bit more of a talk was Ta'ava. Ta'ava for doing the Avodat Hashem, like David Amelech says, that's all I want. That's all I really care. That's the most important. Of course we care about our families. Of course we care about our people. That's part of the life. That's part of our mission. That's part of the, the Torah, the mitzvot, to help, to give charity. Of course we want to do, we want to help, we want to feel for people. Wanna, yes, but number one importance is the service of Hashem. I remember when I was recently married, I had a come somebody got into a conversation with me and he asked me what do I do? So I said I'm trying to serve God. So the guy says, No, 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 I meant to ask you what do you do for a living? So I said, if that's what you meant, then say so. What do I do for a living? That's a very different question than what do I do? I was actually like making fun and he was laughing on this understanding where I was coming from, but I wanted to make a point. And that's why I stressed it. Don't ask somebody, what do you do? Because the automatic answer from a Jew should be to that question is, obviously it should be, I'm trying to do my best to serve God. If you want to know what somebody does for a living, then say, what do you do for a living? Oh, that's a different question. And I play this game with kids sometimes. I approach a kid who's 13, 14 years old. What do you want to become? What do you want to be? 
I think a doctor. I think a lawyer, an engineer. Oh, I'd love to do this, I'd love to do that. I told him, no, 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 you're completely wrong. I didn't ask you what you want to make a living from. I asked you what you want to be, and you should say an Eved Ne'eman Lashem, a devout servant to God. Isn't that what every Jew should want to be? But why don't they answer this question? Because they don't think that way. You see what I mean? That's why it's one in a hundred thousand. Nobody thinks like that. What do, they, what do you want to be? A, a basketball player. <laughs> really? That's what you want to be. What about an Eved Ne'eman Lashem? That too. <laughs> That's the main thing. Everything else is shtuyot. It's nonsense. That's not the, what we're here for. That's only a means, not a goal. A means to, you know, we have to survive, so we have to work. We have to do something to earn an income. What can we do? The Torah says you got to sweat. Even though some people are not sweating, it comes to them. The money <laughs> just comes to them. But anyway, that's a beracha. Or their mazal. But that's not what life is about. Yeah. Want to build beautiful buildings, houses. What for? He enjoys it. Okay, but that's not the main goal. That's not what, not what we're here for. Everyone has a unique mission that he's here for. And of course, he, every one of us contributes in some way. But the main thing that should occupy our mind and our main goal should be to make him happy, to make Hashem happy. If all the Jews or a good number of Jews thought that, when Moshiach would have been here a long time ago, let's make him happy. Let's not worry about what the United Nations says. Imagine the Knesset all saying, forget them. Let's concern ourselves on what he says. Wow. Moshiach would have been here not today, yesterday. In the whole Knesset, is there anybody that says that? No, not even the religious ones. But you approach the religious one, you tell them, why didn't you ever say that? He says, well, that's obvious. You know, we don't have to mention that. We have, we have to worry about the, the kids, you know, the uh, stipends, the families, education. He says, I understand we have to worry about that, but you, you need to say that. That's, you have to be Mekadesh Shemaim. You have to remind everybody that this is the Ikar, and this is the affair, this is not important. You have to say that. You're religious, you have to stand up for that. For Kavod Hashem. People have to realize that there's not going to be peace with the Arabs until there's peace with Hashem. Because they are not the problems, we are the problem. They don't understand it. It's one after another episode incident in the Tanakh where we have troublemakers. What for? Why are they bothering us? Mind your own business. No, Hashem says, I sent them because you're not doing your job. <laughs> if you do the job, they wouldn't bother you. Don't you get it? And Hashem tells us in the Torah, clearly black and white in big letters in bold. In Bechokotai Telechu, you're going to have it easy. If not, you're going to have it hard. Why? Because that's the way I made up with you. We made an agreement in Matan Torah and Har Sinai. Don't you remember? You yourself said, Nasev and Ishma. Then it means you assume responsibility. Uh, keep your word. Because I kept mine, Hashem says. So you see? So without learning these things, people don't realize it. And they, yeah, they go, live their life like vegetables, you know, vegetative type of life uh, uh, routine. Some days are fun, some days are not so fun. But the essence is missing. The essence of what am I here for to begin with? What, am, what, what, should I, what should I accomplish? And even though everybody has a different mission, the general common uh, area that people need to share, all Jews need to share, is that we're servants of Hashem. And how are we all sharing in this service? In our prayer, in our mitzvot, in our learning of Torah, some more, some less, in our giving of charity, in doing good deeds. We all share in this one area, some more, some less. This is, what, this is our mission. Some people's mission, of course, is a little bit different. Hashem has blessed them with tons of money, millions and millions of dollars. Well, obviously, their mission is going to take a different path. It will be much more, hopefully, if they have brains and they have a heart, they're going to use that money properly to help. Because otherwise, why did Hashem give you that money? He actually made it obvious to you, if you think about it. The wealthy man's mission is much more obvious than our mission. You know, what are we supposed to do? Right? So the, the one that Hashem gave other skills, he can do other things. Beautiful voice. Okay, use your voice. Be a Hazan, be a Baal Korek, Torah. It doesn't mean you can't be an architect. You can be an architect too. 
But Hashem has given you a talent. What for? It's just mazal? No, it means you should use it. And if you use it, you can do so much in, in, in uplifting people. So certain midot, even though they appear not to, not to be good, they can be used for the good. Anyone who doesn't try to work on these midot, you should know, I don't envy his shalom because many, many trouble homes today, divorces, chloket, and lack of shalom bayit, is only because of one of these three midot. You know, kina, kavod, they're upset, they're, they're you know, all kinds of things that are related directly or indirectly to one of these three midot. So shalom bayit could really gain so much if people had better control over these midot. So even though we, talk, we spoke about a problem and a, sim, and a symptom, where's the cure? As I was reading this Mishnah, I was saying, but wait a minute, Rabbi Eliezer, please give us a cure. Don't just tell us the problem. The reality is, I remembered, the cure was already given to us before by a Kavya ben Mahalalel in Perik Shlishi. And there was various other Mishnayot that pretty much encouraged us to do certain things that will be able to help us avoid many of the of this people this pitfalls and what does he tell us in the very beginning of perish the sheet look at the following three things and you will not come to sin dame i bata know where you come from where you're headed and before whom you're going to give a reckoning and an accounting remember those we learned that a little while back so El did give us more or less even though it was earlier on at least one solution one way to to overcome this. If one really thinks about where he's headed, what he's here for, where did I come from? From nothing. Right? I'm headed you know, to the camera and later to Olam Abba, to Olam Haimet, to give an accounting of what I did. I said, I really have to worry about having the latest car. Come on. I really need a four and a half thousand square foot home. Two and a half, three thousand is not enough. I need a swimming pool too just because he has it. I need to make a big wedding just because everybody in the community makes big weddings, especially if I don't have the money and I have to borrow the money, going to debt for that, to feed people who I haven't spoken to for the last three years, who tomorrow they will forget what they ate anyway and won't appreciate it and still complain. Think about it. Some people, because of the pressures of society, they actually do stupid things like that. Big weddings when they can't afford it, I'm saying. You can't afford it to make it in your backyard. You don't owe it to anybody. The couple will be fine. They'll have a movie. They'll have photographs. Not in a big hall. In the backyard. Think about it. Do you really, really need this? You, the people are not strong enough because they don't have clarity. If you don't have clarity about what life is about, what the mission is, then, oh, what is he going to say? What the neighbor, what the community is going to say? It's going to look bad. They'll forget about it. You have to be very, very strong. But there's no way a person can be strong enough unless he learns Torah. So therefore, the cure to this is to know where you come from, where you're headed. And that is what the next Mishnah fits in very well with this Mishnah. The next Mishnah is actually some sort of a continuation to Rabbi Ezra Kapar by telling us, pay attention to the following details. The next Mishnah says like this, and that's pretty much the last Mishnah of the Perik. Huwaya Omer. Hayilodim lamut, those who have been born. What's the next step for them? What's going to happen after their birth? They're going to die. Sounds depressing, but you'll see why he says it. Hayilodim, therefore, those who are born, the next step for them is to die. Hametim lachayot, those who have died, they have a next step too. They're going to get up again. Tchiat hametim during the resurrection. And those who are still alive, do they have a next step, an immediate next step? Yeah, they don't. They're going to be judged. Why am I telling you this? He says, Letting you know, because you need to let others know, and it has to be known to everyone. Keep this always in mind, that part of what life is all about is to remember Shehu El, that He is God. Who are Yotzer? He's the creator. Who are Bore? He, he formed everything. Who are Mevin? He knows what he's doing. Who are Dayan? He's the judge. Who Ed? He's the witness. Who Baldin? And he will be the Baldin. In other words, he will be the prosecutor. 
והוא העתיד לדון and he will be the judge. ברוך הוא שאין לפניו לא עוולה, there's no corruption before him, לא שיחה, no forgetfulness, לא משוא פנים, no favoritism, לא מכך שוחד, no bribery, שהכל של everything belongs to him. So before we go on to the second half of the Mishnah, what's this all about? He's telling us life is by design. Life is not just by chance. Life is purposeful. People come, go, but don't disappear. There's actually a certain cycle here, not the cycle of necessarily of coming, going back, and coming again, because that's already reincarnation. Cycle meaning more that there is a, a certain direction, that's a better word, a certain direction where is, which is all planned out by Hashem, which if you, we observe it, we can see the handiwork of Hashem. We can see that life has meaning. But not only meaning, he's, he's telling us here, look, before you know it, you're on the other side. You're walking on the ground, but before you know it, you're beneath the ground. Why, why let us know that? Because life is short. That's one of the reasons. This beautiful contraption, this beautiful design, this beautiful creation is short. You know, as we know it in this dimension, it's short. And therefore, think about it and make sure you don't waste your time because eventually one will be held accountable for his deeds. And as Kohelet tells us, that man has to continue to remember that ultimately he's going to his olam. To olam. This is my olam. No, 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 no. This is just as we learned before, a prosdor. You're always walking lebet olamo. But why say walking? Well, it's a little bit depressing if you tell a person you know that you're walking to your grave. What do you mean walking to my grave? Well, every day that you're getting older, you're getting closer to your grave. Not that the grave is bet olamo. Obviously, without Hashem, every neshama will have a share to the world to come and be in a good place, not just the grave. But it's a way of reminding a person how you see yourself today is not how it's going to be soon. What we see today, the reality of today, is not the reality of tomorrow. Here, it is a time, of course, as we've seen before, to accomplish, a time to do mitzvot and masim tovim, because it is, it is through the mitzvot that Hashem wants us to acquire our share to the world to come, which basically means that Hashem wants us to achieve our ultimate tachlit through life and death. You know, so this cycle, or this direction, called life and death, is purposeful. This is the way Hashem wants us to acquire Olam Abba. That's, that's His plan. But remember, it's short. And one stage leads to another stage. For, this, for those who are alive, the next stage is to be judged. The next stage is to leave this world. So this particular Mishnah has many, many valuable principles in Judaism. One of the principles is that there is a mashkiach in this world, that there is one who overlooks, right? A, who is directing this world, not only created this world, but directing everything, and he will be also the judge, right? And what does he want us to do? As we said earlier, part of what he wants us to do is to make it known, not only to ourselves, but to others, that he is God. That he's the creator. The al yafticha yitzrach shasheol bet manoslach, and don't let your yetzerara mislead you to think, yeah, the next step is uh, cessation of existence. That the sheol, the grave, is a place of refuge. Ah. Oh. Finally, I'll rest. Finally, no troubles. No, 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 no. It doesn't end there. So don't let your yetsha think, well, by the time you, especially people who are having trouble in a difficult life, they say, well, at least, you know, soon it'll be over. But this is especially true for those chaz v'shalom who are thinking about suicide. They say, I'll get rid of all the troubles through she by going to the Sheol. No, the Sheol is not a bet manos. You will not run away from your troubles. Your troubles will only begin there if you committed suicide. 
by throwing away the gift of God called life. You know how terrible punishment that is? It's a terrible sin. But people think that that is the manos, that that may be a refuge to their problem. The correct way to handle problems is to deal with them. Hashem never gives a person a challenge that he cannot deal with. You may need to speak to people, you may need to seek help, to get you know, additional help, but not to run away from the troubles. Because it doesn't end there. The Sheol, it doesn't end. That is why the commentaries tell us that it's wrong for people to be so overjoyed when a baby is born and be so sad when a person dies. Why? Because it should be the other way around. Think about it. People are overjoyed and happy when a baby is born, but the baby is crying. You think about it? But the baby actually cries usually when it comes out of the mother's womb. And everybody's so happy, he looks like her, he looks like him. You know? <laughs> And when he dies, everybody's sad and he's happy. <laughs> Hopefully he's happy, depending on what he did. That's the way it should be. When, a, when somebody comes into this world, he doesn't know what's going to happen. The baby was so good, it, he was so secure in his mother's womb. According to the, our tradition, he was learning all of the Torah. He doesn't want to leave that place. Nobody wants to come into this world, as we will see in the second half of the Mishnah. So in a way, it's good to leave especially if one left and after I've accomplished everything. So people don't have very good understanding. This baby may turn out to be a monster. When a person leaves this world and we're able to eulogize him that he accomplished everything, that he was a good man, a good brother, a good father, a good friend, a good husband, that's good, right? So to have that kind of clarity is only when a person realizes that this is not all there is. I'm leaving here, I'm going into the Ikan, to the main life, which is all of Abba. But why, why are we born? And this is the last portion of the Mishnah. It's, you're born and created against your will. And you die, and you live, and you will die against your will. And you will, against your will, have to give an accounting before a Kadosh Baruch why? Well, we don't have a choice. Hashem wants us, as we said before, to come through this, to go through this, eventually to have a share to the world to come. But an accounting involves some sort of responsibilities. If we're accountable, that means we have some sort of responsibility. And the way it works is like this. Hashem says, listen, I gave you free will. The free will enables you to have judgment. Since you were able to judge, right from wrong, I will also judge you. In other words, Hashem's judging us is because of our ability to judge, for our ability to make certain choices, which means that we have responsibilities. So yes, it's true. It's not very much that they consult with us, are you willing to be born? But after we're here already, we want to make sure that we do the right job. And it is possible for us to do the right job. But before I finish, Another very important principle that was brought out in this Mishnah is that there is Tchiyat HaMetim. Even though he focuses mostly on don't lose your focus from what you need to do, life is short, you will be eventually going to be responsible, he does mention in his words that there will be life afterwards and there will be Tchiyat HaMetim. Because HaMetim LaChayot, he says, the dead will rise. Very important principle in Judaism. You know that I've actually spoken to Jews recently and I told them that Tchiyat HaMetim can start maybe in about a year or two. And they said, you really mean it? This is going to happen? Is that really possible? I said, what are you so surprised of? This is one of the principles of Judaism, of our faith. You don't understand that? He says, but that's so impossible. Why is people think it's so impossible? A tree, a big tree, 50 feet tall, 60 feet tall, a fruit tree. Do you know that it was once a seed? We put the seed in the ground, and all, all eventually comes out a fruit tree, a big tree with many fruits. Why is that possible? And, and a human being, if you put it in the ground, he can't come back up. The reason for that is, is because when we see nature, we attribute everything to nature. Oh, the sun comes up, because the earth rotates, and we see the sun again. Oh, there's a tree. Oh, there's grass. We take it for granted because we see it and we say we call it all nature. Is it all nature? 
when we say the bracha at night in Tfilat Arvit, Amarib Aravim, Chokmah Poteh Hashanim Bitvuna, right? All those words, beautiful words, talking about describing the wisdom of Hashem and how the constellations are in place, how they illuminate the world, how everything is so orderly. We're amazed by it. What are we doing? We're saying words not only to praise Hashem, but to strengthen our Muna, that we have clarity and understanding that Hashem is is responsible for all this. He created all of this, and he obviously he wants certain things of us. So to us, it's not nature. He is behind this. At Chiyat HaMetim, I do admit, and the rabbis do say, of course, that once it occurs, will be the greatest Kiddush Hashem. On that day, we say, the Prophet says, my name, God's name will be sanctified. Because everybody will say, wow, that's it. This, this has to be God. All right? That, that will just basically prove it beyond any doubt. So that's going to happen. And some of your grandparents may be younger than you, depending when they, how old they were when they left the world, because according to our tradition, they get up the way they left at the same age. Afterwards, they will be healed and cured, and they will feel young again. But in order for us to identify them, recognize them, we will have to see them the way they left. If you see your, your grandfather when he was 20 years old, you wouldn't recognize him. right? But when you see him the way you left, oh, grandpa, you know? So this is incredible. This is about to happen, and I'm not exaggerating. And I, when I say a year or two, the reason I say a year or two and I don't say today is because Mashiach can come today. Mashiach can come now, any second now. And he's going to come very, very, very soon. Tchiat HaMetim doesn't happen the same day he arrives. That's what I'm saying. Year, two, maybe a couple more years. And according to our tradition, it lasts for 40 years. Not everybody gets front seats. You know, to get up early and get a front seat to see Mashiach, you have to be meritorious. So it lasts, right, for a number of years. But eventually, all those who need to get up will get up, even non-Jews, by the way. So this will be a tremendous day. This can happen any time soon. So the rabbis are telling us here, don't think this is an impossibility. That's the next stage for those who have been dead for so long, is they're going to come back up. Very important idea. There's a saying in somebody, I saw it in some English book, that, let me see if I wrote it down here. None is so blind as that who will not see. Doesn't want to see, doesn't want to believe. There are people like that. There's so many wonders, so much chokhmah to see in this world. People don't want to see, they're, they're blind. They're simply blind. So the Mishnah tells us that Dasha Kolefia Cheshbon. What does Lefia Cheshbon mean? Everything is according to certain Cheshbon. A, a, a mortal king can only give one death penalty, right? Guy killed 100 people. You can't kill him 100 times. A Melech Masav Adam is limited to how many times he can punish and what kind of punishments he can give. When he takes into account a person's life, he will take into account every little thing. And it, there was many, many wrongs. For every little wrong, he will have to account for. Even a Jew, Chas Shalom, became a uh, heretic, became a mumar. For every single time that he does not make a beracha when he eats or drink, he will be held accountable. There was once a guy who came into a house the Gaum of Vilna was in that house asking for a drink, and he was not very, very religious. So the Gaon of Vilna tells the Palabai, the host, don't give him a drink until he makes a blessing. So he got upset. Rabbi, I'm not Jewish anymore. He says, you can't throw away your Judaism. You can't stop being Jewish. You're going to be held accountable for every single time you don't make a blessing, for every single time you do something wrong. Don't think just because you stop being Jewish, you stop being Jewish. It doesn't happen. It can't be. You're going to be responsible for even for the smallest thing you didn't do right. The guy heard these words. He became very serious. He felt that he was wrong all along, and he, dec he decided to do Teshuvah. In other words, he heard the rabbi's words, and they, I, apparently they convinced him that his way of thinking was wrong. You can't just drop it. You know, we're into it. We made a promise. We made a commitment. We're into it. You can't just leave it. So Lefia Cheshbon means everything will be accounted for, no matter who you are, no matter what you did. Mm -hmm. But Cheshbon is also good. Cheshbon 
you buy potatoes or tomatoes and you pay, you know, so much per pound, 49 cents a pound, you buy 100 tomatoes or potatoes, you're going to be paying 49 cents a pound, but you're gonna, your, your bill will be double. But depending on how much you buy, that's how much you pay. When it comes to mitzvot, the cheshbon is different. Imagine like one carat diamond costs $2,000. Does a 10 carat diamond cost 10 times as much? Much No, much, much more it could be, right? Because a 10 carat diamond is a completely different kind of gem than a one carat. So it's not just doubling it. A kolifi cheshbon, when, a person, when it comes to cheshbon lemala, Hashem is going to take everything into consideration too. You had it very difficult. In the home, it was a struggle to be Jewish. To observe the mitzvot was very, very not easy. I mean, it was just a struggle. Hashem takes everything to consideration, all the cheshbon, and therefore the cheshbon of every mitzvah and every kavanah that a person had in his prayer and his mitzvot will be many, many times much more than just the one mitzvah, depending on how, how he did the mitzvah, depending on how many mitzvot he did, depending on how much devotion he had. So a kol lefi cheshbon, and this cheshbon, of course, can only do God who is aware of everything. He's the judge. He's the prosecutor. He's the witness. Everything is recorded. Nothing is forgotten. Only he can take into account all of these things. Then there is a cheshbon about pain and suffering, too. The Gaon of Ilan once gave a class, and he was talking about the, the Gehenom and the punishment of what happens upstairs to those people who are big sinners. And he says that all that is, this, that is described, I think, in the Sefer Chesed de Abraham, which is a Kabbalistic book, he says, that's a drop in the bucket, he says, to what's really going to happen. So one of the students became so sick. He was so ill. He, 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 I guess he went into a depression when he heard that, that they sent the rabbi to please go, you know, look what you did. <laughs> you got it very bedridden. So, you, so what does he tell the student? Don't take it like that, he says. You don't realize, he says, people in life go through so much pain and suffering here in this world that by the time they get upstairs, most of their pain is gone. Most of the suffering that they had to suffer up there is already gone by now. So don't worry about it. You know, there was people who are otherwise more or less good, but they've done things. You know, we, did, we made mistakes. Hashem takes care of them here. All the embarrassments, the insults, pain, money losses, all these things. You've already had your gain on here, right? So it says, don't worry about it. So that's also the fiyach bone. Everything that a person suffered here, everything. You go into your car, oh no, I forgot something at home. You go back, you close the door, you go back and you, you forgot the keys. That's pain. That's also kapara, that's an atonement too. All of that, every little thing is cheshbon. You're against your will. You live against your will. You, you die against your will. You will give an accounting before God. So here the Mishnah pretty much ends, the Perik ends by telling us that in the end, we all have no choice. We're going to give an accounting for our deeds. And it appears to be very depressing, a depressing ending of, of life and how life ends. But in reality, it's not, a, it's not depressing at all. The Mishnah is not trying to depress us. What is the Mishnah really trying to accomplish here? Life is very, very straightforward. Born, live, die, judgment. Therefore, since I just told you what it's all about, and I gave you a little bit more clarity, all that you're asked to do is prepare yourself. What is this compared to? You're driving on the freeway, and all of a sudden you see a sign Half a mile down, there's a toll, prepare for payment. If you've been in the East Coast, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. right? You gotta prepare yourself. You don't wanna come at the last moment, let me see if I have the money, I have no change. Okay. Prepare yourself before you come to the toll so we can go faster through the toll. All the signs therefore ahead telling you toll ahead is to prepare you. All of this, what he's doing here is, is for us to be prepared. Prepare yourself. The Baal Shem Tov was crying right before he passed away. And I'm sorry. The students were crying. The Baal Shem Tov was actually happy. <laughs> the Baal Shem Tov was, was you know, saying his last words, and all the students were crying. Kvod Arav, what's going to be? You know, without you, 
you know, here they're sad and he's calm. And he was saying, listen, this particular moment, I've been preparing for it all my life. I'm not concerned. I'm not afraid. He says, every day I was preparing for this. Every day I was getting closer to it. So all my life, I've been preparing for this moment. This shows clarity. This shows, of course, calmness. But of course, he, he, on his level, he could be that calm. And last but not least, is it fair? That's the last question that we need to really answer. Is it really fair that we are forced into this world and life and then have to give an accounting for everything? I mean, we, they, nobody ever asked us. Nobody ever asked us for permission. You really want to be born. So is it really, really fair? So the best way to answer this question with, is that with the mashal of the Dubna Magid, famous rabbi who used to give parables and stories and anecdotes to help understand. He says, you will be able to understand this point with the following anecdote. There was once a father of two daughters. And he had a very hard time marrying off his two daughters. One of them was very ugly looking. And the other one had a very, very sharp tongue. She, she had a problem that you would call in Farsi, jigar <laughs> Yeah, you know, she eats your liver. <laughs> yeah, is that, is that like a nag, is that the right way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you don't want to live with that. So how am I going to marry them off? <laughs> very hard time, nobody wants. Finally, he found Baruch Hashem, he had a good mazal. For the one who is ugly looking, he found a son in law who's blind. And for the one who is very nasty in her words and speech, he found a man who's deaf. Ah, Baruch Hashem! He's so happy and he was really, really elated. One day, the son in laws hear that a, a, a great doctor is coming to town who can cure all ills. And he's willing to give you your money back if, you don't, if you're not satisfied. Great! Let's get the cure. So the blind person became healed. He was able to see. And the deaf person became able to hear. You can imagine what their homes looked like the following day. <laughs> they were, they, the Shlom Bible was completely gone. They were so unhappy, so depressed. Couldn't take it anymore. They ran back to get a refund. From the doctor, give us back our refund. We're totally not satisfied with this. I'm not giving you back the money. I cured you. They went to a rabbi. Rabbi, you know, they, he said he would give us back our money if we're not satisfied. Rabbi says, you're right. But if you're really not satisfied, then you have to agree to go back to what you were before, deaf and blind. Oh, no, 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 no way in the world. We want to stay this way. If that's the case, that means you were healed, you were helped, you have to pay. The Magid of Dumna says, yes, we don't have a choice when we come into this world, but once we come into this world, what don't we do to want to survive and to live well? We want to enjoy it. We don't want to die. Oh, so you do want to stay around? You do want to have the life? Pay. Pay. You see? Of course. Once we're here, we do want it. Once we're here, we do want to enjoy it. Oh, you do want to enjoy it. That means you do appreciate it. That means you do like it. That means you want it. You don't want to get rid of it. Oh, so now pay. Now you'll be held accountable. That is what the Gaon of Vilna says. This fits in very well with the Gemara. There's a Gemara that says two neighbors, Reuven and Shimon. Reuven decides one day to put three fences around this field. Three fences. That's all he needs to surround this field. Shimon is a neighbor to him, so he gets the benefit of having these fences built around. He didn't have to pay for it. The Gemara says he doesn't have to pay the cost of sharing it because he didn't ask for it. Reuven wants to put fences, let him put fences. Why should Shimon have to pay for it, even though he benefits from it? Goes on, the Gemara says, however, if Shimon goes ahead, now that he has three fences, he puts up the fourth. Ah, you're putting up, Shimon, you're putting up the fourth fence? That means you like the other three. That means you enjoy, you benefited from them. You agree that it's a good idea. You pay and share in the cost of the other three as well. You see? Similar idea. In other words, you like it, you enjoy it, you, you participate. That means you, you want it for yourself. And that's basically how this pedic ends. That eventually we're going to give an accounting, and that accounting is going to be based on 
our knowledge, our personal experience. Hashem will take everything into consideration, of course, but nobody will be able to say, oh, I didn't realize, I didn't know. All of these things are, are just excuses to ignore, to, 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 to look away, where a person really, if he has brains, can observe and see and learn. It's accessible. It's on the internet today. It's everywhere. No excuse not to know. Say, oh, I didn't know. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? It's kosher and the more so when it comes to life that, that involves so many responsibilities. Life is so precious, so important, it's so short that a person cannot afford to look away. What am I here for? If this is important, I better do a good job. And how, what, what will I know? What to do? Learn. If you learn, you'll be able to figure it out. Don't be blind. Don't be deaf. Appreciate that we've been given the opportunity to serve Hashem, especially Am Yisrael. We are His children. We definitely have greater responsibilities. And it is up to us, of course, to do our best job. The good news is that Hashem helps those who help themselves. Amen. That's a guarantee that those who will make their best effort, Hashem will always be with them. Amen. Amen. Amen.